Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. Now turn to section 1. You will hear a conversation between an international student and the accommodation department. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 3. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Hello, Accommodation Department. How can I help you? Uh, do you look after accommodation for international students? Yes, uh, we look after accommodation for all the students. Good. I hope you can help me then. I've only just been accepted onto a postgraduate course and I want to know if there is any accommodation available from this September. I know it's very short notice. Mm, yes, uh, it, it is rather late, but I'm sure we'll be able to find you something. Uh, first of all, can you give me your name and student number so that I can find you on the system? Sure. My name is Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Uh, how do you spell that? G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z. Thank you. Got it. And your student number, please? S H U three zero zero seven one five P G. S H U three zero zero seven one five P G. Ah, here you are. Department of Modern Languages. Yes, that's me. You now have some time to look at questions for the ten. Listen carefully and answer questions for to 10. OK, now there are several options for postgraduate students. Firstly, there is the Trigon. Uh, this is a new block near to the station and not far from the main campus. Accommodation is what we call cluster accommodation. What does that mean? Uh, there's a small group of rooms, usually six, each with its own bathroom clustered around a lounge kitchen area which is shared. Oh, I see. That sounds good. They are very popular. Uh, the price for these is £99 per week, and we do have some availability left. However, for postgraduate students, there are other options. And what are they? Uh, there's another apartment block called The Cube, located near the west gate of the campus. Accommodation there is in one or two bedroom self-contained flats. So, The Cube is self-contained? How does that work? Well, basically, they're just like ordinary apartments. Each apartment has one or two study bedrooms with ensuite bathroom, a lounge and a kitchen. And what is the price of those? Uh, for the one bedroom, it is £180 per week. And for the two bedroom, it is £110 per week for each person. And can I choose who I share with? If you have a friend and you would like to share with them, of course, we can reserve a two-bedroom apartment for you both. Otherwise, you just have to share with whoever else is there. Uh, obviously, it will be another woman. Hmm. I will have to think about this. Do I have to make a decision now? No, but we don't have much accommodation left, so I can't guarantee that there will still be availability if you leave it too long. Yes, that's fair. I have a friend in the management department who might like to share. I will speak with her and get back to you this afternoon. OK, fine. Uh, do let us know as soon as you can. I will do. Thanks for all your help. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 2. You will hear a speech given by the head of a company to some new employees. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up 10 years ago by myself, John, and my then girlfriend and now wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby. We felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood and we love it. <laughs> While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the National Park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. We'd also organise rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then, each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So, five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full-time on Barker's Country Safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organising activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 17 to 20. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. Now, often this is sold out and we have all of our 10 Jeeps and convoy with eight people in each Jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide, so as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here so they come back for the bigger tours. Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at 8am and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from 2pm to 6pm, and then evening ones, 7pm to 11pm. All the tours follow the same route, and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the Family Exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually it is just one Jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. 
These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal. Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to these specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we're keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. That is the end of section T. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between two students attending a university open day. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. Excuse me, is this seat taken? No, by all means, have a seat. Are you here for the open day? Yes, I think I've just about finished now. I got here first thing this morning. What about you? I got here a little while ago. I spent some time walking around the place first just to get a feel for what it's like. I'm doing the organised events this afternoon. I thought I'd have a coffee before I get started. It's a lovely campus, isn't it? Yes, I love it. And the facilities are unbelievable. Mm. I've just been over to have a look at the sports centre. There's an Olympic-sized swimming pool, a gym, squash courts, <laughs> everything really. All the high street banks are here, and the bookshop looks better than the one in town. There's supposed to be a big supermarket a few minutes walk from the main entrance, so there's pretty much everything you need here. Yes, I really like the look of it. Um, I wonder if you can help me. I think I need to register to let them know I've arrived, don't I? I'm not sure you have to. You can just pick up an information pack from the desk over there. And nobody asked my name or anything when I turned up for the events earlier. I just walked in. But you never know, they might check after to see if people have bothered to come to the open day, so I think it's best to register. Thanks. I'll just finish my coffee and then I'll get started. Mm. So, uh, is this your first open day? No, it's my fourth. I've been to Sussex, Coventry and Birmingham so far. They've all got their good points, but being a bit older, I'm particularly keen on somewhere that has a few students my age on the course. Mm. Apart from that, they all seem to have great links to businesses, and there isn't much to choose between them as far as their facilities are concerned. How about you? I haven't been to any other open days yet, mm. but I'm hoping I end up here. I've just been to a presentation by the head of department. It sounds like a great place to do maths. Uh, that's my subject. He was telling us about all the avenues open to maths graduates and the kind of work you can end up doing. A lot of students go into finance, accountancy, banking, that kind of thing. I can't say that's ever appealed to me, though. My maths teacher at college was telling me about the opportunities in the software industry, which I quite like the sound of. Before you hear more of the conversation, now look at the questions 26 to 30.
Listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. Well, I hope you managed to get in. According to the letter they sent me, my department is doing something similar. There's a talk later this afternoon by the head. I can't miss that. There's also someone who'll be explaining about the year abroad. Apparently, you can spend your third year at one of their partner universities in Spain or Germany. I'm going to have to give that a miss, though, to catch my train. Oh, and there's also an exhibition area in the physics department with some of the things people are doing here. I'll try and catch that. There were a few second and third year students at the exhibition I went to. One of them gave me some great tips on finding work as well. I already knew about a couple of accountancy firms in the area that offer work experience. That's on a voluntary basis, though. But apparently, the students helping here on the open day get paid. And the university advertises other jobs that come up now and again, so that's worth remembering. And a lot of the shops here are always looking for staff. Mm, that's useful to know. I overheard someone saying there's a tour of some of the halls of residence in about half an hour, so I think I'll register and try to fit that in before I go to the talk. Are you thinking of living on campus? I've not made my mind up yet. I don't live far from here. My parents' place is just the other side of town. I could easily get the bus onto campus. Plus, it would be a lot cheaper if I stayed at home. But it would be nice to get some independence as well. So, I don't know. I'll have to see. But I didn't know about the tour. Would you mind if I tag along with you? No, not at all. Let me just finish my coffee and I'll go and register. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk about whale migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to continue our investigation into the use of technology in plotting oceanographic migratory patterns. And I'd like to focus specifically on creatures that we didn't even realise existed until very recently. Pygmy blue whales. In particular, I'd like to talk about a high-tech method of tracking that researchers have used to find out more about these creatures. Pygmy blue whales, which are one of several subspecies of blue whales, spend their lives in the vast expanses of the Indian and Southern Pacific Oceans. They were first identified as a distinct subspecies in 1966. Before then, they were probably confused with the Antarctic or true blue whale, so it's only recently that researchers have started to learn about them and their migrations to and from their breeding and feeding grounds. Scientists are interested in pygmy blue whales because, although they are a very mobile subspecies, very little is known about their movements and their populations. Large-scale movements of whales are particularly hard to study, and what we do know about pygmy blue whales, we've mainly learned from examining whaling records. There are several populations of pygmy blue whales in the southern hemisphere, and two main feeding grounds off southern and western Australia. 
Scientists were interested in testing their hypothesis that the pygmy blue whales feeding off Western Australia migrate to Indonesia to breed. To track the whales' movements, researchers made use of something called satellite telemetry. This refers to the use of a satellite-linked tag attached to a whale. When the antenna on the whale breaks the surface of the water, the tag communicates with the satellite system. The location of the whale can be determined when multiple satellites receive the tag's transmissions, much like how the navigation system works on a mobile phone. Researchers receive this location data in almost real time via the project website, which allows them to track the movement of the tagged whale from many miles away. The use of these tags has enabled researchers to discover that pygmy blue whales do indeed travel northwards from the west coast of Australia in March and April, reaching the warmer breeding grounds of Indonesia in June. They remain there until September, at which time they then return to Australian waters. In addition to identifying the migratory pattern of this particular population of pygmy whales, research has also shone new light on the whales' feeding patterns. It's usually assumed that whales go without food outside of the summer when they leave their feeding grounds. But interestingly, the pygmy blue whales studied travel from productive feeding grounds off Western Australia to productive areas in Indonesia, and therefore probably still have the opportunity to feed whilst they're in their breeding grounds. It is hoped that mapping the migratory movements of the pygmy whales will help conservation efforts for these endangered animals. And the study has enabled researchers to identify specific conservation issues. For example, the migratory routes of pygmy blue whales correspond closely with shipping routes. Consequently, researchers are keen to monitor whether this has any negative effects on the whale's behaviour. Baleen whales, these are whales that use filters to feed, not teeth, use sounds to communicate and to gain information about their environment. Clearly, as pygmy blue whale movements correspond to shipping routes, there is potential for the noise generated by ships to affect communication and hence social encounters and feeding. Previously, researchers could only hypothesise that pygmy blue whales occupying Western Australian waters travelled into Indonesian waters. Now that this hypothesis has been borne out by evidence, conservation efforts can be undertaken in a wider area than just Australian waters. However, scientists aren't stopping here. A question mark still remains over the movements of the pygmy blue whales that utilise the feeding grounds further south, off the southern coast of Australia. Genetic evidence indicates that there is a mixing taking place between the population of whales in the feeding grounds of Western Australia and the population further south. Researchers are keen to discover whether the pygmy whales from the southern feeding grounds follow a similar migration route to those from the west coast, or whether they migrate to the subtropical region to the south of Australia. As a result, there are plans to tag the pygmy blue whales further south in order to find out whether they move through the same areas as the western population and are therefore exposed to the same risks. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening. Thank you.